experiment this Sunday with an amazing sermon on pythons and other snakes. If you have a certain request, I invite you to fill out the yellow piece of paper and give it to me today. And then, uh, looking ahead, uh, you have a bunch of stuff happening this weekend. Saturday is Warrensburg Pride. It's 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the Elks Lodge. And so, uh, we'll be there, and we invite you to come and be there with us uh, to celebrate and express God's love for all people. Also, Saturday, if that's not your jam, we have a, a time to get together and work at dinner cleaning up our nursery here because we're not doing Sunday school anymore, so if you'd like to come help us with that, that's Saturday at 1.30. And then a uh, personal announcement, a lot of you know that my daughter, uh, Olivia, dances with Center Stage. Her recital is this coming weekend. So if you would like to see Olivia dance in person, she will dance on Friday night at 7 p.m. at Hendricks Hall and on Saturday night at 7 p.m. in Hendricks Hall. If you come on Saturday, you can also see me dancing with her. But if you have to give me party, I highly recommend it. We got this whole Joe Jet thing going on. It's awesome. I really mean, like the coolest thing you've ever seen. So, uh, if you want to be part of that, you're invited uh, to that. You can buy tickets there at the door. Any other announcements? Marjorie. Did you give the cats a cup of food?
your sin is blotted out. For you are God's beloved children, forgiven, loved, and free. My friends, know in your heart sin that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. I might have these loud. I'll turn these down a little, maybe. I don't know if that makes any difference. That's straight. She's loud. I have, I have people say it's not like it's a garment. Like I have a whole microphone. I don't know what that means. I can turn her down because she sounds good here. Because I, I get that lag. Right. I do get lag. That must be weird because you were hearing it. Well, yeah. What we hear there. That's why I don't say. Turn down these monitors. You don't, you're not getting anything out of this one. No, okay, who wants to go first?
opens, and you can see the motor as the fourth blue line. And you can see the detail in it. share up there all right we will go up here I brought my glove from Malawi <clears throat> and uh, when we were at the church which was under a tent it had no building um, they gave each one of us something they had carved so that's so oh that's awesome I brought today a picture of a high schooler and uh, I brought this high school. <laughs> I thought uh, this picture of a high schooler was on my, it's, it's on display in my house. I found it when I cleaned out my uncle's house, this picture of a, of a very nice high schooler. It's not even their senior year. I don't know, maybe their sophomore year. So I'll let this, or freshman here, I'll, let, I'll pass it around to the choir, the picture of a nice high schooler there, a very nice high schooler. I know Olivia brought uh, a show and tell. That looks like somebody's somebody lost their muff down here. <laughs> I brought Gracie, my American Girl doll. I got her when I was four or five. Um, but the clothes she's wearing were made by Marilyn Harding as a Christmas gift to me. So, yeah. Gracie in Marilyn Harding clothes. Does anybody else have a show or a tell? Yeah. Um, I would show you my bird feeder. I wasn't here last week, but I want to thank the Christian Ed Committee for that. It's really nice. Anyway, I wanted to tell, especially Abby. Last night, my cat, he sleeps in the garage at night, and I believe he's afraid of mice. But he was acting really strange, and he kept looking at my freezer. And I saw something there behind the freezer, and I went and got my flashlight. I had a nice big black snake in my garage, which I am happy about because the mice are awful in my garage. So I hope he stays. I'm not going to catch him. And Midnight survived the night. I was hoping he wouldn't hurt the black snake, because I know the black snake could not swallow him. <laughs> Other shows and tells. Yeah. Oh. So I have two things to say. I haven't blamed them. One's too big, and, and I did not know that it was show and tell. But So I have this little bobcat stuffy. I, I have so much names for him. I got two names for him. Bobby for Fobby and also Stinky and Bobby <laughs> Jr. That's awesome. Thank you. The thing is my Hot Wheel Ultimate Garage. He had a giant T-Rex that if a car got ate up by the T-Rex, this little butt thing and snap it the car and, and the car drive down. Ah, 
awesome! Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for telling me about that. This and this. I, Cindy, I bet that snake was a black rat snake because they eat mice and they're big and black. Good snakes to have. All right, Mark over here. I want to, I want to tell you that Marjorie gave me these wonderful socks this morning. <laughs> So I appreciate that so much because I wear fun socks. And I want to tell you, Pastor, that I thought of you this morning when I was getting dressed because my socks say, happiness is a glass of wine. <laughs> Those are awesome. Yay. Any other show and tell, friends? All right. We will do it again. So the last Sunday in June, be thinking about what you might bring for show and tell. Thank you, everybody, for bringing your shows and tells. Our first scripture reading for today is from Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and that's on page 2 of your Pew Bible. Now the serpent, the serpent was more crafty than any, any of the wild animals the Lord God has made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing, and e knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves.
this is the last Sunday for the choir uh, for this season, so let's hear it for the choir. Yes, Kathy and I did a great job coordinating our outfits to celebrate this day. We are, we are so thankful for the well, choir, I, like I know, that. for all the good music that they've given us this year. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you, choir, for all the hours of practice and preparation. We have so enjoyed the gift of music throughout this season. Thank you. And now, let us pray. Gracious Lord, as we gather around your word in scripture today, we ask that you would open our minds and hearts, that we might have a fresh understanding of who you are and who you call us to be in this world. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. Listen for the word of the Lord to you this day. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, so give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you end. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, what would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, friends, welcome to our summer sermon series special request summer. All summer long, I will be preaching on the topics of your choosing. This topic is pythons and other snakes given to us by Abigail Epps. So I will preach on everything and anything that you write down on that piece of paper. This promises to be a fun and educational summer for us as each week I will challenge myself to craft a sermon around your requests and ideas. Some weeks will be more traditional style sermon, and some weeks like today will be totally new and different for all of us. And I have to admit that when I saw the topic pythons and other snakes, I knew I just had to go for that one first. So, friends, are snakes in the Bible? Yes. Where? Genesis. Yes, Genesis. The most famous snake in the Bible is the serpent in Genesis. In the beginning, there was a snake. Friend or foe? It's hard to say, but the serpent is more crafty than any other animal the Lord God had created. Smart, cunning. The serpent plays the role of the trickster in the story of the first sin. The snake speaks, asking the woman to repeat what God said. Can you eat of every tree in the garden? Why not try the tree of knowledge? For it will open your eyes to good and evil. And the woman sees that the tree will make her wise. And so she takes of the fruit and eats it and offers it to the man. Is the snake a liar? Hmm, maybe. 
The fruit of the tree does open their eyes to both good and evil, but also to shame and blame. And while they do eventually face death, neither the woman nor the man die immediately upon eating the fruit, as they might have thought, based on what God had told them earlier. For his sin in the garden, the serpent is punished. Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. The sin in the garden, like all sins, leads to broken relationships. The woman and the man exist in conflict. God and the people are separated by lies and blame, and nature and people are forever in a broken state. Because of sin, the serpent, while wise and crafty, is now our enemy. We are forever set at odds against each other, living in fear and distrust. What began as a creation myth to explain our state of sin and our enmity with snakes and nature grew into a personification of evil in the early church. When the book of Revelation is composed, the serpent becomes synonymous with the devil. That's why you sometimes see statues of Mary stepping on a snake. When her son Jesus conquers evil, that is seen as the ultimate, she will strike your head from the Genesis curse. But like so many things in our scriptures, snakes don't stay bad forever. You might remember a few months ago, we read that weird story from Numbers where God sends snakes to bite the complaining Israelites as they wander the desert with Moses. In that story, Moses crafts a snake of bronze and lifts it on a pole, and those who look to the snake are saved. People really liked that bronze snake. They liked it so much that in the time of Hezekiah's reign, they had to go and smash and destroy it because people were worshiping that bronze snake and making offerings to it instead of to God. In our second reading for today, Jesus tells his disciples to take on the qualities of the snake. So the snake can't be all bad. In this reading from Matthew, Jesus summons the twelve and sends them out to spread good news among the people of Israel. They're given the power to heal and sent out with nothing more than the clothes on their backs. Jesus says, I'm sending you out like sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So, how might we be as wise as the serpent who is more crafty than any other animal that the Lord God made. Just how smart are snakes, anyway? Well, a test conducted several years ago at the University of Rochester shows that snakes actually are pretty smart. In fact, the study suggests that when it comes to learning and cognition, the snake is a lot more like humans than we might have first imagined. David Holtzman, a neuroscientist at the University of Rochester, created a study that challenged snakes to escape from like a black plastic tub the size of a kid's wading pool. There were cards on the arena's walls and tape on the floor that would give the snakes visual and tactile clues to find their goal, which was a hole in the bottom of the tub, a place for them to go hide, right? Just like how Abby's snake is hiding right now today. That's what snakes want to do when they're uncomfortable somewhere. And so the researchers were giving them this. The snakes would have a really strong aversion to the bright lights and the open spaces found in the arena. So when a snake was first placed in the arena, it would circle around the edge looking for a way out. And this team of scientists would nudge the snake in the right direction and found that snakes could be taught to find the exit and to remember how to use the cues to find the exit again in successive trials. 
speed to the goal was one of the measures to show that snakes were learning. And on average, snakes would take 700 seconds to find the right hole, the hiding hole on the first day of training, and then go down to about 400 seconds on the fourth day of training. Some snakes were really, really fast and they could figure it out in 30 seconds. So we see that when tested in a biologically meaningful way, snakes exhibit spatial learning similar to birds and to rodents. Just like humans, Holtzman also found some age-based differences in the snakes. Young snakes are more adaptable and resourceful. They could use a variety of clues to find their way to the exit. Older snakes rely more heavily on visual cues and became, and this is a quote from the study, befuddled. <laughs> Older snakes become befuddled if the brightly colored card marking the exit hole is tampered with. I can think of a few elders like, that might be befuddled by that. So science says snakes are smart. I think that's what Jesus was asking of his disciples. Be discerning in your evangelism, right? Use common sense. Be open to learning new things. Be aware. While snakes are solitary animals during good times, when the going gets tough, snakes stick together. During the winter months, snakes often hibernate in groups in communal dens to keep warm. Olivia has had personal experience with this, as last spring we found a clump of snakes while we were working in a flower bed. Yes, so that was a very exciting day. So we do know it happens here in Missouri. They'll find a spot and they'll all get together to stay warm. So too, we should stick together when the going gets tough. We can be wise as serpents creating a safe shelter here in our community, offering a warm place to gather together in safety. And while, yeah, we can make it on our own out there, when the going gets tough, we do better together. Since the beginning of time, it has always been us and snakes. God created them for the Garden of Eden because they're an important part of the ecosystem. Just like Cindy was saying with her show and tell, they keep the rodent population in check and help keep the balance in nature. Snakes are generally timid and they avoid people when they can. There are 3,500 different kinds of snakes all over the planet. Pythons are the longest and can grow up to 33 feet. The largest gathering of snakes in the world is in the Narcisse snake dens in Manitoba, Canada, where tens of thousands of red-sided garter snakes huddle during the winter. People travel there in the spring for a road trip to watch them all emerge from hibernation. Perhaps the Ebb family would like to spend spring break in Canada uh, and witness, witness the arrival of tens of thousands of snakes. Not, not for me. <laughs> so while snakes might make us nervous, they are a really important part of God's good creation, and they are not evil or bad. That is silliness. Rather, Jesus says to us, be like the snake. Go out in the world wise as a serpent. Be aware of your surroundings. Have the capacity for learning. Stick together when life gets tough. That's it, friends, for pythons and other snakes. Next Sunday, our special request sermon will continue, our summer sermon series. Next Sunday is Jude 2, Mercy, Peace, and Love. And today is the last day to turn in your sermon request. So if you have an idea, make sure you write it down on this yellow piece of paper and give it to me today so that you can get on the list of sermons. And friends, if you see a snake out in the world this afternoon, say hi. <laughs> Amen.
Please be seated. And uh, Mary McCord's going to come up now and share with us a God moment. Mary? Thank you for this opportunity to share. There's a few people here that may not know that on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the entire basement is taken over by a mission we have that feeds breakfast and lunch to primarily homeless people, prim almost all of them street people, but anyway, primarily homeless people. And we also provide clothing, and we also try to provide tents and, and uh, other things. And so lots of times, um, my God moments are where this very practical side of being hungry, being naked, being cold or hot or whatever it is, meets the mystical, the highly spiritual. And so I've had people ask me, what goes on down there? What do you do? Well, when JM isn't cooking breakfast, he's watching a movie. And Sabrina Ray and Liv and Lee are all playing cards. Mark listens to gospel rock on his headphones. Someone is usually talking to me about their needs and I'm trying to put it into a computer program I have. Patty's usually reading a book. And Nicole, when she's not washing the dishes caused by JM doing breakfast, she's watching funny cat videos. And every so often she'll just cackle, just, ah, you know. So Nick's doing online training with Microsoft to get certificates so he can get his programming job back. And so I asked Barbara if I could repeat this, but one time she said, it's not what you expect, it's so quiet. People are down there, they have community, they're chatting, or if they're not, they're sitting, right? It's pretty quiet. Well, that's what they want. They want a quiet, uneventful life. But sometimes they can't do that. They don't have any slack in their life. And so what I mean by slack is when something goes wrong, you take some other asset in your life and you use it. So if you and I need money, we might take out a loan, or if we get sick and have no money, we might use our credit card to tide us over. Uh, if we got sick, we might call into a job, and we might stay home in a bed to get better. Well, if you have no assets, or credit card, or bed, what do you do? So they say there are no atheists in foxholes. We were talking about it in Sunday school. And homeless people are very, very religious. And they can quote scripture to me, and they often have one little thing that they are very hung up on, but boy, they are religious. So one day a woman came in, and she was wailing, just wailing. And of course, a couple of other ladies went over to comfort her and help her and whatever. She looked terrible. Her whole face was red and lumpy and had sores. Her hands also, right? She had them bandaged. And so I'm thinking, call the police. This woman's been beat up, right? I mean, she looks terrible. She said, no, she hadn't been beat up. She was demon oppressed. And she wanted an exorcism. And I said, well, I don't do exorcisms. But Marjorie had called Heather to come down. So I was pushing for what I could do. Let's sit down here and have some lunch. When was the last time you ate? Well, she hadn't eaten in two days, and she hadn't slept in a couple of days due to this whole skin thing going on. And communication wasn't very clear cut because there was a lot of emotional, like I said, wailing going on. And I was just certain she'd been beat up, right? I was trying to figure out. You know, we call the police, we take her to an emergency room. What are we going to do here? She wanted that demon exercise. That's what she wanted. So, um, you know, she's in fight or flight. I don't know what to do. But Heather came down, and she sat down at the table and prayed over her, very quietly prayed over her. And... Uh, I was telling Robert about it later. He's our secretary, if you haven't had the pleasure of meeting him. He's our secretary. 
And he said, well, did it work? Did it work? I said, well, yeah, I guess it did, because she shut up and ate her lunch, <laughs> right? She quit all the screaming and the crying. She shut up and ate her lunch. It ends up she did have an allergic reaction. She had put cream on hands, on face. She had done all this, had the most awful allergic reaction I've ever seen. And of course, with no health care, you're not going to go to the clinic and say, fix me. It took her two weeks for all those scabs to heal up and you could still see them and everything. This was a real problem, but she wanted the oppression of demons gone and she was relieved. I don't know how many of you believe in that or not. I'm just going to say what I saw. There's that practical side of I'm going to feed you, clothe you, etc. And that spiritual side I need love, I need forgiveness, I need redemption. And those are my God moments. Powerful story. Thank you, Mary, for sharing. We come now to our time of prayer and sharing our joys and concerns. And I'm wondering what, what we can be praying for today. Abby? Yes, definitely a joy that school is out for summer. Other joys and concerns today. Joys and concerns. Safe travels for, Safe travels for this Memorial Day. Other joys or concerns today. Yeah, Chris. Prayers for veterans and those who have served. Others. Yeah, Marjorie. Prayers for Marjorie's daughter, Irita, who's having surgery this week. Others. Yeah, Nancy. Prayers for Nancy's friends who are going through suffering and grief. Others. Prayers for those in New Guinea as a landslide has wiped out towns and villages. Prayers for peace in Haiti and for the families that are in grief at death, the missionaries that were killed. Others. Okay. Then let us turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer. God of the multitude, you see all of who we are and all of who we have yet to be. So we lift up to you our limited scope for imagining who you are and what you desire for us. We invite you to move in those spaces and ways that confound our capacity to find our way through. By, be, by the powers of your being, let our world be drawn to your vision of greater wholeness. May the call of Christ, which models for us what it means to embody your radical hospitality, urge us toward a more honest reckoning of the ways in which we remain closed off to one another, to ourselves, and to you. May this enduring commitment to your vision propel us toward a more courageous and compassionate expression of faith. Let your spirit breathe fresh life and understanding as we seek to renew our relationships with one another. Let her imagination be made evident in our conceptions of who you are and how we could be fruitful witnesses of your transformative work within us and among us. 
Loving God, we bring to you the joys and concerns of this particular community of faith. We thank you so much for this summer break out of school. And we pray this Memorial Day for all of our veterans who are active and those who have served. We pray for safe travels for folks as they go back and forth to celebrate. We pray for places of the world that need your touch and peace, for the people of Papua New Guinea as they seek to recover from this landslide, for the people of Haiti as they continue to live in violence. We pray especially for the families of missionaries who are in deep grief as they deal with and grieve the loss of their children to violence. We pray for Irita as she has surgery this week that it would go well and that your healing hand would be upon her. We pray for Nancy's friends that are in a time of great suffering and grief. We pray that you would be with them. We continue to pray for those on our prayer list. Prayers for your healing presence to be with baby Milo and Margaret and Michael. Prayers for your peace and blessing upon the people of Malawi. Prayers for the people of Ukraine as they continue to suffer under war. We pray for the people of Palestine and Israel, especially the people trapped in Gaza. We pray for peace, gracious Lord. We pray for those who have suffered abuse, for those who are looking for work, for those who are deployed and away from their families, for those serving as first responders. We pray for our homeless brothers and sisters that come to this church to find shelter and hope. We give you thanks for all of the folks in our community that serve that community. We pray for this good earth. We thank you for snakes and bees, for bugs and blessings, all the goodness of creation. We pray for our country and our church. And now we offer the private prayers that rest deep in our hearts this day. We worship you, holy God, along with all of the earth. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, the one who taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. It's not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite Amber up. She's going to talk to us for a minute about Warrensburg Pride. continuing nightmare that I tripped down this aisle, so that's why I take my time. Um, so I'm here to talk a little bit about Warrensburg Pride. The Fellowship and Outreach Committee every year sponsors our table at Warrensburg Pride. That is this coming Saturday, the 1st of June. Uh, it opens to the public at 11 o'clock in the morning and then closes at 6, and then everybody clears out, and then they check IDs for the drag show. You come back in after 6 o'clock when they can check your ID. So our table runs from 11 to about five o'clock when we'll break it down and put it away. Uh, Pride is a fun event, it's a family event. For those of you who don't know this, the reason that Pride is in June is because that's when the modern civil rights movement for LGBTQ people began in New York City on the 26th of June in 1969. So it's not just about rainbow flags and drag shows, this is also about community and history and providing a safe place for people who otherwise don't have safe places uh, to come together. That's what Pride is for. So if you are interested in volunteering to help run our table, the table is all reserved and I've bought up all the swag. So if you're interested in coming to help with the table, please let me know so I can put you on the list and get everybody scheduled. The other thing I wanna mention is that Rainbow Fellowship, and if you don't know what that is, that's a group here in the church that also works outside the church. For anybody who identifies as LGBTQ plus and just needs some fellowship and some support, that's what that group is for. Um, we're going to start meeting again, I think, this month after a long hiatus. Thank you, COVID. So if you are interested in working with me to get that group rolling again, we're going to meet really briefly in the parlor after church just to pick a date. Okay? 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Amber. Jesus offers us new ways of living and doing life and faith. In this moment, you're invited to consider the abundance of this invitation and to respond from a place of your own abundance through your own gifts. Offer what you will, not as an act of obligation, but rather as a reflection of gratitude for everything that God has promised to do within us, among us, and through us. I invite you now to present before the Lord your tithes, your gifts, and your very hearts as Mark presents a gift of music. Gracious God, your love overflows in the gift of your spirit. Bless these gifts that we offer, that they may spread that blessing in a world of hurt and need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. friends go forth from this place in peace to love and serve the Lord and be blessed by the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.